Okay, so let's uh, uh, continue. So as, as I said, the Shaw Fastman method. Uh, basically, the, 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 it's a bit unclear exactly what they propose to do, but they basically say they assign all residues the probability to be in a certain state. And then they scan through to the different helices, and then they repeat this until they locate all the helices, and then they scan through the fine sheet regions, so they have a cut of a certain amount number of residues and certain cut off. And then you somehow solve these conflicts if you find both of these, and then they take their turns in between. In the papers, they claim you're 70 to 80 percent correct, but if you try to implement the argument, you often end up with something with 50 to 6 percent. But the key, th key importance here is basically that you have a preference for an amino acid to be in helix or sheet or turn. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the normal acid to, I guess, to 100 for being. Uh, uh, random, so they have 140 salines. Salines like to be in the but not in the sheets. You can see glycines are in turns, but not in the other ones, etc. So basically, this, that's what we saw with the logs before. Valine is preferred to be in beta sheets, but particularly not in turns, etc. Uh, but there is also information that you can see that if you take that you have actually like frequency information. Uh, of the following residues. So it's not only one residue tells you if you like to be in here as a sheet. Also, you see, for instance, if you have a glycine here in a, in a uh, well, you can't do this. Just look at the next slide. Well, uh, actually, it's easy to do this slide. So basically, if you look at the, if you look at the problem like that. So you want to, if you, this is going to be a preference, right? if you have a helix residue here and a helix residue here, even the residue in the middle is likely to be the helix. But, uh, so actually, to predict the secondary structure of one residue, you want to look at the residues surrounding it also. So if you have, I mean, thing is that you want to make, like in half twist, you want to make a running average. But clearly, for instance, if you think if you have a, Polar residue here, and the unpolar there, and the polar here. So you really have patterns of every second residue being polar. You know it should it's like to be beta sheet. Every third residue is, is, is like to be a, a, a helix. So what you can do is that you can actually take all your data and calculate the, for every position you know the secondary structure. And then just count how many times do we have a helix in the position before or helix in the position after? Uh, or have a helix here, how many times do you find lice in the position before and the lice in the middle? Or in the position? How, how common is it, if, it, if it's a helix here, how common is it to have a lice in the end of the position? And how common is, is it to have a glycine, etc.? And then you can, so basically you have the probability to find a certain, given that it's helix, you have the probability to find this amino acid in a certain position. So you can just sum up these probabilities and you see does this position in the middle fits best to be a helix, sheet, or loop. So basically you have three classes. So of course, if you, if you go far away in the sequence, if you go fix the residues before, that residue will not have any, it doesn't really have any information if you're going to be sheet, loop, or helix. But actually you have residues up to maybe 10 residues before and 10 residues after. So you have a window like 21 residues that actually contains some information. <coughs> So this is what uh, the Gore argument did. So Gore said with Garnier, Osco, Torp, and Robson. So they had the same probabilities basically as in Schaffersman, but they also can take care of the surrounding residues. Like here, so basically you can also have this information, but for instance, if you have have a capping residue. No, I think this is the wrong way, sorry. If it's a residue like the end of the helix here, this can still be nice, nice being helix there. 
So actually, the low pressure you hear or here might make it likely more likely to be helix in the middle, you, or at least a sheet, because you know the sheets are a certain length, etc. So this is the state of the art. They had there was on the order of 62, 65 cent acres, something like that. And this is this is from 78, or well, the third acres was in 1990. Basically, it was just updated statistics and updated a little bit different window, but basically the same thing. So uh, you had 20 times 21 or 17 entries in this case, so the window was 17 in this case, and 20 million asset types. But actually, if you, the, the predictions were not, even if it was 60% correct, they were not very good. Because this is observed, this is just one example, you have an observed prediction here, which is sheet, 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 and then a few sheets here, and one, two, three, four sheets, and then some smaller solutions. And all do you actually have quite good agreement, particularly the loops agree very well here and here. You actually do, you predict here is to be in the sheet region, which is that you absolutely should be completely wrong. And you have a sheet and here is next to each other here, and you have very short sheets here. And here, here, here is a mixed sheet in helix, not a helix sheet thing. So really, the method was uh, not very accurate. Uh, even, but, and, and actually, one, one reason was there was much worse repeater sheets than other helices. There were much higher accuracy repeater sheets. Oh, and uh, in general, the secondary structure elements were too short. Uh, so, uh, so in general, the secondary structure elements were too short. So, so that's when Burke had lost enter the field. So. This is the PhD method that was developed in the early 90s, published in 92, 93, the first version of it. 93, as I said. So the key thing here, there are a few things that were obvious. Mainly was that they actually used evolution information in type of profiles. You, you used multiple six alignment. It didn't use side blouse, because side blouse didn't exist. But they used similar ideas. It actually... Uh, then use a neural network, but uh, that was not the first method to do that, but it was one of the first. And it used, was the first one that really, I would say, obtained a prediction accuracy of over 70%. So how did they do that? So starting the profile is not that hard, you can imagine, instead of having, if you start with a neural network, we have a mean asset sequence here. Uh, we have the classification of uh, um, secondary structures, sheet, 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 etc. Here, uh, we have in this case we only have four amino acids, which is hard to read, but you have four, four and alignment of four cases. So we have uh, normally if we had only one sequence, we had the network, we would, we would we would have used sparse encoding. We just have zeros and ones here in all these twenty numbers. But here what I did was that they took actually the fractions. So if this is uh, well, yeah, five, five amino acids, so if this had two alanines, one alanine it has 20% or 20. If it has a uh, lysine or whatever it has there, it's, a four, it's 40%. So basically you just take the number of um, uh, the frequency of each amino acid in these types. So yeah, replace the sparse encoding with frequencies. Simple. But then it also added some information about the number of gaps, so the number of deletions or insertions, I guess, they have here. And uh, uh, something, I guess, is how conserved it is, basically information about how conserved it is. So this is, has the value of 1, so basically the entropy of this position, I guess, on that. So you have in the order of 23 inputs for each uh, uh, position in a sequence. So that is, quite, that is sort of quite uh, obvious and you, you can easily see how you can do a narrow network to do that. You can just take a window here and predict the position of the center last you. So that's what it did. In the first layer at least. It started with the network, so it took a window here. 
Vad heter det exakt sen? Jag tänkte inte in och utlagt 20 sen rätt. And the network predicts three numbers. Helix sheet loop. So the probability has been here in any of these three states. And what it predicts is for the central residue here, but also takes the surrounding residues into account. So here was one advantage compared to the Gore method is that you can have this kind of XOR statements that we talked about the other day. So you really said, if I have a polar here and I have a polar two residues before, it's likely to be a sheet. It's not that just, just a polar two residues before is good for a sheet. So you have, if I only have that, not that. But you couldn't do in a simple statistical method. And then, still, of course, these kind of predictions are not, I mean, you might have very close borderline cases. You might have things that are 49% chance to be sheets and 50% chance to be helix, and then you just pick helix. But, but if the two rest is next to it, it be sheets, it would probably more likely be just as a sheet. So you take a urine network, or a structure, well, I might call it structure, structure network. So basically, they take the outputs from the first network and use it as an input and take a window of that, and then they train the second network that doesn't use them I mean, as a sequence, but using these three probabilities instead. So basically, it's somehow it's like a filtering system. You want to have here, this is a next to each other, like that. And it has been shown that you need something like this to go the good predictions. You could get to skip it if you use maybe two, la two hidden layers here. So using a more complex network, it's more difficult to train, you can maybe skip it. But in general, you need almost two layers. They actually used a third layer also, which is a urine network. They actually made a number of different versions of this, I think six or something like that, or four or something. But for instance, they used balanced and unbalanced training. So basically, in balanced training, you have equal number helices, sheets, and loops, and in unbalanced, you have the number that are represent that are found in uh, uh, particular secondary structures I mean, in, 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 in the, they're found in the database. So you have uh, fewer sheets than you have uh, helices and loops. So so they actually they use and they use some different window sizes. So there's some different methods that are slightly different, but they, they and then they use the Euro system which will basically have to take Found it several times and maybe say three apples and take the top of this. And they also have some filter here somewhere around at the end. But as a consequence, uh, they actually obtained quite different things. So this is an example. This is not the same as before, I think, but it's similar. So you have these sheets that are one, two, three, four, five sheets. For some reason, it's a small helix in between. Show first month somehow predict here. This is here. Actually, it's 59. It's still 59 percent correct. But it's, look at all this 59 percent correct. It's mainly because all the loops are predicted correctly, and a few of the sheet regions. So 59 percent is not that good because we really say well the guess that this is a protein that has here is sheet mixed for it, but it's actually is basically beta sheet protein. The Gore one. Obtains slightly higher numbers, but it's equally bad. Basically, this thing is a helix in the beginning, and it just happens to predict a few of these rest of the helices, and uh, I don't just few are other the other way around. A few of these be sheet, I mean. So it's slightly better, but it's not, and a few more loops maybe over there. And uh, while the PhD expects 72 percent, and it still doesn't be mistake. It still thinks that this region here is actually a helix. But it's an unusual mistake. And what is further more important is actually it has a reliability, which is basically just as in signal P, which said there was the score, a little difference in the score between the, whatever you predict and the second highest prediction. So if that is big, you have high reliability. If it's low, you have low reliability. So you have one, two, three sheets, and four and five, and three, one, two, three, four, five sheets. And the helix here. And you see here the scores are like one, two, three, four. So there are loads of scores here. The stars here are the high pre predictions. So they are six, nine, six and higher. And they are basically all correct. So this region here is correct. This region here is correct. This, these two are here are correct. This is correct. This is correct. So if you have a high prediction here, you actually can know that you are quite likely to be correct. Or very likely. 
Mm. So it has been used for what well, long time ago we used for half million sequences. Mm. Okay, I think I have a slide. Let me see. Let me show you one slide. One slide I want. How can I make it bigger? Well, I can't. This is some bit. Somehow, this image seems to be very strange. But okay, I'll show you anyhow. Uh, so this is not supposed to be this formal, but I couldn't change it. So th this is the pipeline of of, of PhD. It's very similar to what other papers do later also. But so basically, you start with the sequence. Uh, you use BLAST because BLAST already exists in those days. But it was BLAST once. So you find all the homologs. Then you did the math, you did the math six alignment calling something called max home or something like I think. And here instead of using an e value, they actually used a cutoff of percent identity versus the length of the alignment to use as a filter, which is not as good as an e value, but that was the best you could do in those days. So you end up in the multiple six alignment, and this is used into these three layers of networks in <coughs> as I described earlier. <coughs> and at the end you get this uh, material. One problem here is also that these methods here, are not, these multiple six alignment methods, are not that fast if you have big families. They're not like side maps, but they're, they're, in those days, you didn't have such big families. So that was not a problem, but today, if you had 10,000 sequences, you would not manage to do them. They don't, wouldn't work. Particularly, would also probably make bad uh, alignments. But anyway, what was clear in this case uh, is that you had. The PhD was the first method to more than 7% of, of Q3, so of accuracy. It had quite pretty good length distribution expression. Basically, helices had the length of helices, sheets had the length of sheets. Compared to the early method, it had much better beta strand predictions. It had a good correlation between the score and the accuracy. So basically, when, they are, when you have a high score and reliability, it's more likely to be accurate. And in general, what you saw that if you had more sequences, so you had more, I mean, uh, sequences in your multiple sequence alignment, you got better predictions. They never tried more than 50 something because they haven't been an example, but in general, to have 5 was better than to have 1, or to have 10 was better than to have 5. Um, after that, it was uh, other methods that were developed that used similar ideas. Particularly used to multiple six alignment. For instance, one idea that people used was the nearest neighbors. So this is not nearest neighbors of phylogeny, but it's basically you take all the known structures and you basically align it against all of them, and you look at the sequences that are most similar. 
So you basically find whatever you take all the alignments and say, okay, this is this sequence part looks more similar to a to a uh, uh, most uh, homologs I found are helices, and then uh, oh not, not homolog, most of the sequence I get some kind of alignment to is a helix, and I guess in a helix, etc. So you can calculate the average second structure for all these hits. Of course, the problem here is of course that actually the best part of everything is to use homology. If you really just if you find a homologous structure, uh, a protein or a homologous sequence that you know structure of, you, the secondary structure agreement with these methods is probably 95% to 90% identical. So you have So really, if you want to test the method like that, you need to exclude all the homologs. That's why I said it was not maybe so sustained as later test and CASP. So this is, this is make a critical problem here. When if you do a method that you, you have a trick, so if you can use homology, so somehow use this homology, you're going to do much, much better. So that's been very, very careful that you don't use this in training. Otherwise, it won't work later. And nowadays, the methods actually combine this homology mapping with second structures, so you use both types. Uh, well, the third method I'm going to mention briefly so is, is Cypred, which today is more than 5 percent correct. And it, it's very, very similar in its implementation as PC, with the difference that is your Cyblast. There are details in the way that you present things with the network, you use the side loss profile scores and stuff like that, but there are sort of details and they have a few different words, so they use second supported machines, neural networks, something like that. But uh, the idea is very, very similar. But, uh, so basically, you find more remote homologs than you did with the blob search. It has only two layers, not three layers, and you try both use supported machines and artificial neural networks. It gives roughly the same performance. It was actually developed by David Jones for having a quick method to do something rough in, in house, and it actually happened to be better than anything else. <coughs> well, David Jones is a genius, but that's another story. But, uh, and of course, there are other methods also. Something called Prof is PhD continue. If you have a PhD, then you get to become a professor, so you have a method called Prof. Some some and the other methods that are develop similar things they are, uh, and they are in the order of seventy five maybe up to eight percent accurate. Eight percent is has been reported, but it's not really clear how obtainable that is. But mainly, actually, the main reason here why these are better than PhD is one, maybe Cyblast helps a lot with medical profiles, but two is that you use there are many more sequences in day. So really, there's nothing really fundamental into uh, methods that are so different than what people did in 1983. And of course, all these ideas here that people use in these methods has been used in many other fields of, of structural prediction or fields of structural analysis. So just to mention a few of these. Is that uh, for instance, people don't turn predictions, so people identifying terms. It's quite difficult to do it accurately because uh, you don't have so many databases, and basically, you can do the homology quite well. Gunnar talked about transmembrane here in his predictions. So you can, of course, Gunnar showed his plots of high probability. Of course, you can train a neural network to so recognize this also, and it might be slightly better than this, this average plot. It's not obvious that it's so much better, actually, because it's, uh, but, but at least you could obtain. You can learn some things that are, for instance, that you know at the end of transmembrane analysis you have a lot of, uh, of, of aromatic residues, and that information could be used in predicting the uh, transmembrane analysis, not just in a simple hydrophysic the plot. There are other ways to do that also that we have used. But so it's not obviously so much better, but then uh, you have coiled coils, particular uh, structures that are coiling against each other. Uh, you use Disorder predictions. So basically, that, that, that it has been obvious in the last 15 years or so that a certain subset of all proteins are not forming structural 
structured domains, but they actually are uh, disordered. So it seems to at least in normal circumstances they're not really folded nicely. They're more they're not probably not random, but they are clearly not as nicely folded as all other protons. And they're partially and that has been of course you can use exactly if you just have a database of this, you can use exactly the same methods for clicking these as used for second attack predictions. So of course David Jones has the Cypad, has the Disopred that does the same thing. Uh, people use it for predicting context this is something I'll get back to in the lecture in I guess next week or this end of this week. I don't know, not tomorrow, but later. Uh, Disulfur bonds. So why do we still care about this, do we? So in beginning, or already um, maybe until 2000 or something like that, it was quite clear that my people thought really that secondary structure prediction was an important step towards 3D structure prediction. And that was probably based on partly misunderstanding of folding. So folding of protein doesn't really occur by forming helices and then they come together like that. It's much more like something starts coming together and then the secondary structure forms from that. On the other hand, there is clearly is a preference of secondary structure that probably folds locally very fast. Because then I mean, that's clear. But it's been also used it's been used for finding homologs. So one way of doing I'll come back to that also later. If you think about it, when we do alignments. So we have a profile. And we have a sequence. And we want to do an alignment of this. We find our way through this matrix. Do you remember? So basically, I said here I have amino acid I here, and I want to calculate the score of aligning this, this profile. So, the probability that I have an I here, basically. But then, if I do a secondary structure prediction, I know that it's a helix, and I will do this a helix. Okay, instead of the score, is some function. Of position j comma i, I can also have a score that is depending on the secondary structure in i and the secondary structure in j, or predict secondary structure in one of these cases. So if the, if there is a helix here and I predict this big helix, I get the higher score. So this was for a while uh, quite useful and is still used in a way of finding different homologs or remote homologs. So somehow you, you get away from the constraints that you will get with one position in, in a, at a time when you do a dynamic programming, but you can actually get the surrounding position also to have an influence there by doing predictions that, that way. Uh, it can be useful for maybe wanting to find domains that time, which we'll talk about later. And uh, well, this, there has was a lot of methods to try to improve it, but I wouldn't say that anybody has done anything fundamental for the last 15 years of secondary structure predictions. We'll actually continue tomorrow. Okay, I think it was. Let me see if I should continue now, or if I should... Uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about... Uh, do, 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 do. Mm. Mm. Volume modeling. No, no, so let's actually let's take, stop now, and I'll keep on talking tomorrow. So, let me stop the recording. Yeah,